We are delighted to have all first speaker, filmmaker and director of Speak Life, Glenn Scrivener, with us today. That's quite the business card, Glenn. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing all right. How are you doing, David? Yeah, really good. Thanks for your time and thanks for coming on today, Glenn. Excited to speak to you today. Glenn, we only live two minutes away from each other down here in Eastbourne, but that doesn't sound like the Eastbournean accent. How did you get here and how are things going? I, as of this summer, I think I've lived in Eastbourne longer than I've lived anywhere else in my life, including uh, in Canberra, where I grew up. So I, uh, I left there when I was uh, 14 and then lived in Wales and then England and then Sydney and then back to London and then back to Canberra and then back to London and now down in Eastbourne. So I'm, I'm kind of half and half now. Yeah, excellent. So when did you first become a Christian? Was that back in Australia? Yeah, uh, I grew up in a church going home and yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think I loved Jesus growing up, but I, I don't think I really understood that it's about his love for me more than my love for him. And I think that sort of burnt me out in my teenage years and uh, yeah, gave my life to Jesus a thousand times uh, in my teenage years as a, as a good Christian lad and then uh, never felt like sort of God had received my life. Here, here was I offering my life up very melodramatically, and and uh, there seemed to be uh, no one on the other end who was interested in wanting me. And of course, that was uh, that was my foolishness. Uh, but then I, I kind of walked away from things for a few years. When I came back, it was really through the Gospels, reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. I remember getting halfway through Luke's Gospel and just saying it's, it's the gift of Christ given to me uh, rather than my little puny offerings to him. And uh, that kind of won my heart, uh, I guess, 22 years ago. I was aged uh, 21 at the time. And uh, yeah, that's kind of captured my heart. Wow. And when did you feel the call to ministry, Glenn? I feel like I was part of the reason why I was running away from Jesus or um, keeping him at arm's length was that I felt that this was so important. I couldn't do anything but tell other people about Jesus. And so um, coming to Christ was pretty closely entwined with saying, all right, um, I, I feel like I need to speak out this good news wherever I go. And so I was, you know, I, I was working for the, uh, the civil service in Australia, the public service, and um, became, yeah, was sort of on fire for Jesus at that point and was not very good at my job. Um, and some of that was just I spent my whole time talking to people about Jesus and trying to get them along to lunchtime talks here, there and everywhere and drag them to church and things like that. So uh, it dawned on me pretty, pretty soon that being a civil servant wasn't really um, for me. And I got a job in a church. Um, I was sort of like an intern type thing for All Souls Langham Place in London. Uh, yeah, within about 18 months of kind of uh, joining the, the, the public service in Australia. So I, yeah, I, I've worked in churches most of my adult life. Yeah, excellent. Glenn, you're well known as an evangelist. Can you remember the first time that you shared the gospel with someone? I can't really. Um, I, I can... I can remember being a very keen Christian lad and trying to get other you know, people along to the Bible study and the Christian union at school and things like that. Um, not usually to great uh, effect. I remember at university, um, I can remember now cringeworthily trying to um, represent for Jesus and not really understanding the gospel myself. Um, and that, that was sort of a theme. I, I remember, like, even, even when I was in London and working for a church, um, I remember going out and sharing my faith on the street with people. There was a, a group that went out on Thursday nights to reach out to shoppers on Oxford Street, and I would be sort of a part of that and offering Jesus. And But, but I wasn't really offering Jesus. I was kind of um, browbeating people and... Um, I remember a friend of mine came along and, and listened to what I was saying. And they said, Glenn, it's, it's great that you're doing this, this evangelism, but um, why don't you, there's another thing on a Thursday night that's actually a, a, a theology course. Why don't you come and learn the gospel? Right. And I remember saying, I don't need to learn the gospel. 
other people need the gospel. That's why I'm here on the street telling them the gospel. And then my friend said, well, maybe you don't know the gospel the way you think you do, <laughs> which was a bold thing for him to say. Um, and I said, all right, then I'll, I'll, I'll give it a term. And so I, I, I took a break from the Thursday night street preaching to do a Thursday night theology course. And it was the best thing I ever did for my evangelism. Because I recognized that sometimes what I was offering people on the street was the, the bread of life. And sometimes what I was offering people was sawdust um, yeah. with a bit of chili sauce for kick. Yeah. And us evangelist types, we're good at the chili sauce. Um, but what about the, the bread of offering Jesus himself? And actually grounding myself in a Christ-centered theology has been the best thing for my evangelism. So, yes, I remember lots of early attempts at, at, um, at sharing the gospel. But I think my advice always is for young evangelists, um, you need to know what it is that you're proclaiming to others. You can't give to other people what you don't receive yourself. And so going deep into the word is, is absolutely, absolutely vital. Yeah, thank you. We're going to be talking about some of the mistakes that people can make when sharing a gospel a little later. I'm interested to know, Glenn, you do so much public speaking, you're, you're always recording different videos, which are excellent. Do you still get nervous? And what tips would you have for anyone that does? I think to be nervous, and yeah, I do get nervous, but I think to be nervous, it's almost always for the wrong reason. If you're, if you're nervous because I'm about to herald the living voice of Christ and that's a fearful responsibility, it's a charge, um, if that's why you're nervous, then that's good, right? Because Jesus, Jesus says, um, you know, as I'm sending you, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And he breathes on the apostles and then says, receive the Holy Spirit. And, and out they go. And he, and he says, and if anyone receives your words, then they're receiving me. And if anyone receives me, they're receiving the Father. He says that both in Matthew 10 and in Luke 10. So it's a fearful thing because, you know, if people receive the little old words of Glenn Scrivener to the degree that I'm offering Christ in those words, they are either receiving Jesus or rejecting Jesus by the way they are treating you know, the words that are coming out of my mouth, which is, let's, it's an extraordinary charge. And um, you should be, you should be rightly fearful about that. And you, sh you should be rightly reverent about what is involved. But what we normally are afraid of is looking foolish. What we are normally afraid of is um, not being liked. What we are normally afraid of is tripping over our words. <laughs> and, and if you're afraid of those things, like forget that. Like who cares about that, honestly? If the living Christ is being heralded through your lips, um, yep, some people might not like it. Um, yep, you might look like an idiot, but um, the glory of Christ can, sh can still shine through that. So yeah, so in a sense, we ought to be nervous, but we ought to be nervous about the right thing. And sometimes you just need to tell yourself, you know, get over yourself, Glenn, just, just, just get up there and let them have it. Yeah, really good. How important is prayer when sharing the gospel? Massively in, in terms of it is, yeah, if you truly believe this is Jesus you are offering to people, then it is, it's not about your oratory skills, is it? And it's, and it's, it's not about you creating a response in people. And it's not about the chili sauce that you're able to add to, to God's word. It, it really is a spiritual encounter, Christ encountering people, even through the lips of this, this evangelist. So prayerfulness in terms of your own communion with Jesus yeah. is absolutely vital. And I really raise a banner for involving prayer in your evangelism, just saying, hey, is there anything you're praying about at the moment? Can I pray for you? Can we pray about what we've just talked about? Um, do you want to take a first step in um, starting a conversation with Jesus? You know, I did that with my neighbor just, you know, I guess two weeks ago. Um, they were in some difficulty and we talked about the difficulty and I just said, hey, do you want to pray about it? I can pray with you. She said, yes. And we started praying and we got into a great conversation after that. And I said, do you want to come to church? She said, yes. And, you know, just, just yesterday, um, she wasn't, uh, she wasn't brave enough yesterday to come to church, but her boyfriend was, and he came along and I'm hoping that he had a great time and he'll invite her next time around. And it all started with just, you know, offering to pray with people. I think, I think that can be vital. Yeah. Brilliant. 
you really embrace the internet when it comes to sharing the gospel, Glenn. How did that come about and how have you seen God work through what you're doing? Accidentally. Um, so I, I guess back in 2011, it was the King James Bible 400th year anniversary and lots of people were trying to figure out how to communicate the impact that the Bible has had on the modern world. And one thing I thought was, what about language? What about all the phrases that we use every day and we don't realize that they are biblical phrases and so I thought up a hundred different phrases and I put them into a three-minute poem in rhyming couplets and then I thought what do I do with this well let's film it so we filmed it and it went out online and it did quite well and then that Christmas there was um I'd written a poem like on the I basically wrote it on the 22nd of December for a 23rd of December um carol service and then somebody said oh why don't we why don't we film it and so we filmed the anti santi ranty and by christmas day it had tens of thousands of views and i was like well that's interesting and then uh somebody said well could you do a poem about halloween and so i did a poem about halloween and that video did well and so it just sort of it just sort of grew from there and it's it's never been something that i've chased it's never been something that i um considered in advance as a, like I'm not a very strategic person <laughs> it's just sort of oh that was that seemed to make an impact should I do some more of that maybe and so I've just sort of pressed into it and pressed into it and pressed into it and I, I had no idea like I don't, I don't know how this technology is working to, to make our conversation <laughs> run I am not uh I'm not technically minded I don't really know one end of the camera from the other but I just sort of surround myself with people who who know a little bit and and it, it just means that um in the same way that Martin Luther could he could nail up 95 theses to that Wittenberg door but if it wasn't for the printing press no one would have heard of Martin Luther <laughs> you know there, yeah. there, there would have been no no reformation really um and it's a tool and tools can be used for good and for ill. And we all know about the dangers of the internet. We all know about how things can go wrong, but it can be a tool for the disseminating of, of, of information. And over the years, lots of people have encountered Christ in this medium. Now it's important to hook them into real life, face-to-face -face embodied fellowship. It's absolutely vital to do that. But if you believe in, for instance, the printing press, if you believe in books, um, then you ought to also believe in um, using technology in order to in order to proclaim Christ to them and in order to facilitate the real life face to face embodied community life, which is the church, which is where things yeah. ought to end up. Yeah, yeah really good. Um, tell us about Speak Life, then, Glenn. So what was the original idea and how was that developed over the years? And also, where do you see it going in the future? Again, accidentally. Um, so uh, <laughs> there was already a charity called the Hour of Revival Evangelistic Association, and it was founded by an evangelist called Eric Hutchings. And he, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, did lots of crusades evangelism, and he would go to the theatre, the, you know, the White Rock Theatre in Hastings, or he'd go to the town hall in, in Liverpool or somewhere and, and for weeks on end, the choir would be behind him and Cliff Richard would come up and give his testimony and sing a song. And then Eric Hutchings would preach and the choir would sing just as I am and people would come forward. It was very much the Billy Graham model. Also as part of that Billy Graham model was the radio show, just as um, um, Billy Graham had the hour of decision in the States, Eric Hutchings had the hour of revival. And that's where the charity got its name from. So he did that for 30 years. Um, and then when he died, there wasn't really um, much of a plan for, for legacy beyond, beyond him. But um, a man called Victor Pierce came on and wrote some apologetics books. And then Ian Nilmine was, uh, um, was in charge when I came on board. So I came on board in 2010. And I was only the second evangelist really to be employed by this evangelistic trust with a 30 year gap after the founder had died. And so um, when my boss retired, it fell to me and we rebranded to Speak Life. And what's been interesting is that lots of things have changed, but the, the core business of the charity has not changed. The constitution of the charity under Eric Hutchings always said that we, um, we want to see revival through proclamation and media. And today, that's what we do, proclamation and media. Um, the media has changed a little bit. It's not so much the radio. It's, it's you know, podcasts and video and um, getting online with social media. 
but there's the proclamation side of things as well. I go around churches and universities and do missions. Um, and then I guess there's a third aspect to the ministry. There's the media, there's the proclamation, but there's also training. And so we have uh, interns here. It's the, the last day of, uh, of our internship um, that's been for, for the years 21, 22. And we've had six interns with us and they come and they, they learn how to preach the gospel face to face, how to preach the gospel online, how to use video and that and that sort of thing. So, yeah, th those are the three aspects that we're, we're always involved with. We, we want to evangelize evangelism. We, we want to share the good news with the church, that the church might share the good news with the world. And we do that via media, via proclamation and via training. Excellent. What are the plans for the future, Glenn? Are you looking to recruit some more interns? Is there anything that you can you can announce now to encourage people to get in touch with you guys? Yeah, you can go, go to the website and, and uh, speaklife.org.uk. We'd love to hear from you. If you if you want to spare 10 months, then you can come down to the Sunshine Coast. David can uh, testify. It's, uh, it's lovely down here. And you can spend some time with us learning uh, how to proclaim Christ, learning a theology of evangelism, a theology of creativity. Um, and and making some fun stuff, you can join you can join us uh, in person. We also have um, some uh, intensive weeks, so if you can't spare a whole ten months to come to us, why don't you come to us for a week in September and a week in March and a week in May, um, and we'll be talking about this kind of stuff. Or if you can't come to us at all, why don't you uh, tune in online because we have regular teaching where we uh, do this sort of stuff, and uh, you can find out all about it at speaklife.org.uk. Excellent. Well, wherever you're watching or listening to this interview, we'll make sure that there's a link in the description below. Glenn, you've also written a number of books. When did you realise that you had a gift as a writer and what's been your favourite book to work on so far? I like the phrase, um, you know, the reason I write is the same reason why dogs bark. Um, it's this, they, they just do. And there's something in them and it just has to get out of them. And so to begin with, it was about blogging, really. Um, and so back in 2007, I think I started, I started my blog and I think uh, counting it up, I think I blogged, um, I, I, at least a million and a half words, um, before I ever got a, a publishing contract. So if, if, you know, when people sort of say, how do I get a publishing contract quick? Yeah. Like, well, no, there's no quick about it. <laughs> um, yeah. um it was literally, it was literally, you know, eight or nine years of blogging almost every day. Um, I, I wrote, I wrote close to two million words, but by, by the time I certainly got got my second publishing contract. So you just do it, and you just do it, and you just do it. And if and if people like what they read, they'll they'll let you know. And blogging is quite good because you've got the comment section, and you can sort of refine what you're thinking, and you get instant feedback from people. And then, you know, after after my fourth or fifth book, I, I guess I had to sort of and and honestly, I, I, I genuinely mean this. You um, after my fourth or fifth book, you start to think maybe I maybe I have a gift in this. <laughs> maybe I should actually pursue this. Maybe I should take myself seriously as an author. Maybe I should take myself seriously as, as a writer. I read something interestingly, uh, interesting the other day. They, they said, um, writers talk about finding their voice and this this um this writer use the voice that you have which again that that makes me think of sort of the parable of talents you know jesus he's he's, he's stuffed talents into your hand you know however many he stuffed into your hands he stuffed them into your hands and the last thing you should do is bury them the last thing you should do is hide your light under a bushel it would be it would be unfaithful um to bury those they are to be employed and so you know there's there's nothing stopping anybody from being a writer if you want to be a writer you could you could start a blog now you could start a, a sub stack now if you want to publish a book you could pub you could self-publish a book there's, there's literally nothing stopping you from being from being a writer but you just got to do it and do it and do it and do it get that feedback listen to that feedback and you know read a lot write a lot and at, and at some point god can god can use that in, in blessing others yeah, I know you've just written a brand new book. What, what's been your favorite book? And also tell us about your new one, Glenn. I really like, so um, with 10 of those, I've done a number of short books. Uh, actually, I've done a short one with the, the Good Book Company as well. But um, so I've done Four Kinds of Christmas and Divine Comedy and The Gift, which I did with the Good Book Company. But pro probably my favorite little short book, and this is great in evangelism, is um, a book that you can read in an hour. 
it's a those those are lovely um lengths to a book because it's the sort of thing if you hand if you hand a tract to someone tracks are good but you can fold them up you can tear them up it can it can just work its way to the bottom of somebody's bag and just become a tattered mess within a day you give someone a book even if it's a short book they are not going to throw that out right that's that's a taboo like you don't what are we book burners nobody book no, nobody throws away a book right so you give somebody a book and even if they don't read it straight away it does sit on their their bookshelf and stare at them for a bit and within an hour you know a, a book that's between i don't know eight and ten thousand words um you can communicate quite a lot about the gospel in that you know it's it's obviously not it's not a novel but you can you can certainly present jesus in a way that's compelling and attractive and 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 lead someone to, to a point where they they want to receive christ for themselves and so I, I wrote a book called love story which i think is my favorite book that i've written and uh it, it just says that you know the gospel is the greatest love story and it talks about love stooping uh love serving love sacrificing and love standing again um and that's that's jesus coming stooping serving suffering bleeding dying rising again for you but, but just framed as the ultimate love story and so the, I've, I've given away hundreds of those um just personally um so I, I love that and then my my new book is called the air we breathe and uh it's it's all about how the triumph of the jesus revolution is seen in the fact that nobody notices it. Nobody notices how incredibly Christian their worldview is because it's so Christian, because it's the air we breathe. Or to use another analogy, we're like goldfish and the water that we swim in is a Christianized culture, a Christianized sense of morality and our moral intu intuitions and, and, um, and assumptions have been shaped by the Jesus revolution so incredibly. And I just sort of traced that out over a number of different chapters. And I talk about um, equality, compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress as these seven values that are now the air we breathe, but they do not come to us via secular humanism. Like there's nothing, there's nothing about the secular worldview that makes any of those values make sense. They have come to us specifically through the Jesus revolution. And if you value those things, then I want you to pull at the thread of those and find that on the other end, there's Jesus. Very good. Well, again, we'll have links to both of those books in the description below. Glenn, the key driver behind much of what you do is the gospel message. For anyone listening that isn't familiar with what that is, what is the gospel, Glenn? The gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as soon as you say who Jesus is, he's the Christ, the Son of God, you get a vision of who God is, according to Christians. Jesus is the Christ. That's a, a, a word in Hebrew. That's the Messiah. It means the, he's the anointed one. He's filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And he's the Son of God, the Son of the Father. So to come to know who Jesus is, you instantly come to know his father, who he reveals, and his spirit, who he pours out on you. And this is who God is, according to Christians. God is a loving union of three, the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit, which means that the world has come from light, life, and love. The trouble is we have turned away from God. We have rebelliously turned our backs on light, life, and love, and therefore we live in a place of darkness, death, and disconnection. That's the world that you and I live in. And it's not just darkness, death, and disconnection that's out there in the world. There's darkness, death, and disconnection in me. Even the people I say I love the most, I treat with such darkness and death. What am I like? Well, I, I'm caught up in this evil. I'm caught up in this darkness. I'm, I'm part of a broken system, part of a broken family, this human family. So what does God do? Well, what does love do when love sees the beloved in trouble? Well, love dives down into the trouble. Love says your trouble will become my trouble. Your darkness will become my darkness. Your death will become my death. Your disconnection will become my disconnection. Jesus, the son of the father, comes and joins us as our strong elder brother, if you like. And he lives the life that you and I should live. You read through the gospels and you see that light, life and love just ooze out of him, just flow out of him. He's, he's just, he's radiant with the good life. And yet 
he dies on a cross in darkness and death and disconnection. Why? Well, because he's doing what love does. Love says, if you're in trouble, I'll take your trouble. If you're in debt, I'll pay off your debts. What is Jesus doing? He's paying off your debt on that cross, dying in the darkness, taking the disconnection from God that belongs to us. We, we deserve disconnection from God. We deserve hell for turning our backs on God. Jesus takes that hell on the cross. And then beautifully, wonderfully, he rises up again into light, life, and love. And he says, you in the darkness, do you want my light? You in disconnection, do you want my love? You, you in death, do you want my life? And anyone who turns from that darkness to Christ, well, instantly you get Jesus as your Lord, your Savior, your elder brother. You get his father as your father. You get his spirit as your spirit. You get his future as your future. It's for free and it's forever. Will you come to Christ? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Really, really good stuff, Glenn. You touched on this a, a few moments ago, didn't you, when you first become an evangelist about getting it wrong or get, you know, partly getting it wrong. What mistakes do you see that people commonly make when sharing the gospel? I think we can turn the whole thing into demand when it's far more better conceived as offer. So Whit Whitfield and Wesley, as they were sort of evangelizing in the 18th century, they kept their journals. And at the end of a hard day's evangelism, when they could have spoken in the open air to tens of thousands of people, they would summarize their evangelism as I offered them Christ. And I think that's beautiful. I offered them Christ. That's what it is. From fullness, we overflow with Jesus. You know, um, the, the motto at Speak Life is love Jesus, share Jesus. And our foundational verse is from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's, it's not, we don't do evangelism from emptiness. We don't think, oh gosh, the pews are empty. Our churches are empty. We need to go out and get from the world what we need. It's not a taking thing. It's a giving thing. We're full. We're already full, filled with the love of Jesus. Out we flow. And therefore, foundationally, what we're doing is not so much gaining converts as offering Christ. And where I think we so often go wrong is it's it's about a it's about gaining converts, gaining converts, gaining converts. And it can come across merely as a law. You know, I've made a decision for Jesus. You need to make a decision for Jesus. Um, and it comes across merely as demand. Whereas what you'll notice when I kind of explained the gospel just before it was far more about the offer of Christ to the sinner who has nothing but darkness, death, and disconnection. And it's Jesus offered to him. Will you receive him? Will you have him? And yes, we do need to bring people to a point of decision. We do, do need to bring people to a point where they receive Christ for themselves. But the center of gravity is not the decision. The center of gravity is Jesus himself and his offer to you. And then by the spirit, let him convict the sinner. Yeah. 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 How important is a follow-up, Glenn, when someone shows an interest? How do you continue that conversation and develop it into a discipleship relationship? This is so vital. And this is the idea that you could possibly do some evangelism and then not do follow-up. I think it follows hot on the heels of a kind of a decision theology that just says the main issue is somebody just needs to make a decision to follow Jesus. Yeah. And then if, if that's, if that's what evangelism is, then, okay, they, they tick a box, they sign a card. Um, and then that's it. And I, I guess they're in because I, I guess that's what the gospel is. It's just having made a decision for Jesus. And the whole problem is everything's just orbiting around somebody making a one-time decision to, to repent and believe. Jesus does not say, he, he says, you know, go into all nations and make disciples. He doesn't say make converts. He doesn't say, say extract decisions. He says make, make disciples. And so the whole, the whole thing is, you know, so my neighbor came to church yesterday. Um, the whole thing is to plug them into the community of God's people so that, you know, when you come to Jesus, you get his father as your father, his spirit is your spirit. You also get his brothers and sisters in the church as your brothers and sisters in the church. And there's just no biblical sense in which you're connected to Jesus, but not connected to church. That's, that's a nonsense. Unfortunately, in decision theology, the church is like, where, where is the church in that kind of theology? If, if someone just needs to tick a box or sign a card or 
just simply make a one-off decision for Jesus, then church just becomes this added extra that has no organic connection to evangelism. Right. But if, if it's Christ, the Son of the Father, full of the Holy Spirit, has come to bring life, and, to, and he's come to pioneer these little communities of life, these little beacons in the midst of the dark world, the invitation to come to Christ is the, is the invitation to come to church, yeah. to come among the body of Christ, and to be part of this movement that can, in the next generation, pass it on and pass it on and pass it on. So follow-up is, is absolutely absolutely vital because it's we don't bring people to simply make a decision for jesus we offer them jesus such that they can get connected to him and get connected to all the other people who are connected to him that they might walk and grow in christ yeah so good what success have you had over the years in engaging other believers to be active in sharing the gospel and how have you done that glenn i guess i mean that's why the training aspect of speak life has really has really grown because I think it would be I think it would be a failure if I just got on and shot my mouth off about Jesus and did not raise up others to do the same. Um, there, need, there need to be other people who do it and other people who do it better than I do it. And so um, and so, yeah, it's 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 vital to do this this training. And, and so kind of on the model of that Thursday night course way back in the day, that I did that theology course instead of going out and street preaching. I did. I did the theology course. Um, I kind of. I kind of run courses that are a little bit like that, um, in in really trying to fill hearts with the love of Jesus, because from the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. If a church gets me in to do you know training in personal evangelism, what I'll really go is I'll go in. I'll, I'll just kind of preach the gospel that I just preached to you. <laughs> And try and do it in a contextualized way, but really try to evangelize Christians first and foremost, and really get them joyful in the good news about Jesus so that they'll bubble over with, with gospel proclamation. So I'll do that. Either churches invite me in to do that, or people come to speak life and, and learn how to do that. I'll go into Bible colleges and that kind of thing and, and try to do that. Go to Christian unions and try and um, just get people excited about Jesus. Because I, I think if I tell you, you need to share the gospel more, you know that. Like if you're a Christian, you already know that. And you probably already feel guilty about that, right? But I, th I think my job is, is not so much to tell you to go and, and tell others the gospel. My job is to tell you the gospel so that you want to go and tell others the gospel. Yeah. And that's the difference between law and gospel. Like, if I simply go and tell you to go and tell others the gospel, I'm just coming at you with law. And some really, you know, supercharged alpha type disciples will rise to the challenge and off they'll go. Most people will feel defeated and they'll be less likely to go and share the gospel. But if I come to you and I preach good news to you, well, then I think that'll enfranchise far more people. It'll, it'll enfranchise the body of Christ to be excited about Jesus. And then you'll just bubble over in witness. And it doesn't matter if your words aren't polished. They, they probably ought not to be polished, but they probably ought to be coming from a place of genuine love for Christ. So yeah. that's how I seek to raise up other evangelists, preach the evangel to them. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say to someone that says that they feel that their faith is a very personal thing and they actually don't want to share it with anyone? Glenn? Hmm. Well, different people do have different temperaments. And I, I think we do need to um, like allow for that. I, I don't want every member of the church to have my personality. Can you imagine? That would, that would be like, <laughs> that would be bizarre. And it would be a, mal yeah, a malformed body <laughs> if we just had people who are all mouth like me the whole time. And, and you know, the, the, the body has different kinds of people. And I do like in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, um, uh, those who speak should speak as speaking the very words of God. Those who serve should serve with the strength that God requires, that, that God supplies, so that Jesus Christ will, will be praised. Um, so th there is gifting. Some people are better at words and some people are better at sort of hospitality gifts that, that, um, that do that. But one Peter kind of is, is telling us we need to come together and people who are more mouthy get together with people who are more hospitable in order to serve the great mission of the church. 
so that in the context of hospitality, in the context of love, those words are going to come across with, with power. Now, does that mean that if you've, if you've more got the hospitality gift, you never share the gospel? Um, no, because one chapter earlier in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, he's addressing all Christians. And he says to all Christians, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So you need to be ready with words. Interestingly, chapter 3, verse 15 doesn't say that the Christian has takes the initiative, not in that verse anyway. The non-Christian takes the initiative. The non-Christian says, how are you still standing after the year that you've just had? Yeah. Um, they notice something about the Christian and you're meant to be ready with words. Those words don't have to be polished. Okay. And you don't have to be an extrovert and you, you don't have to be the alpha type person with the gift of the gap at all. But you, you do need to have words at some stage so that when somebody says, how are you still standing after the year you've just had? You can say, oh, I don't know, but somehow Jesus has got me through. Do you know him? Yeah. And, it, and I don't want you to say those words the way I would say those words. And, they, and, and people shouldn't say those words the same way that you say those words, David. You know, like it should be genuinely coming from, and if you're an introvert, you'll say it in an introverted kind of a way. And if you're an extrovert, you'll say it in an extroverted kind of a way. Um, but at some stage, the over, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth does speak. So at some stage, we do need to be, to, to, to be able to put words to our faith. But I, I often find going to 1 Peter and, and naming the fact that there are different gifts yeah. can, be, can be quite releasing for people. Yeah. You know? We've mentioned just a few of the things that you're actively involved in, Glenn. Being really busy uh, with lots of various projects on the go, how do you safeguard your own personal time with the Lord? Yeah, I, I think, and and it's not just work stuff, is it? It's like family life, and um, that that can just um, really crowd out what's important. And I I think it's got to start with enjoying Jesus. Because again, I, I could I could come and I could say, you know, you should share the gospel and you should have your quiet times. And and you should. Right. Um, but how are we framing that? I think I think what's most helpful, certainly to me, is not even to call it a quiet time, because I'm not a particularly quiet person. Um, and if I sort of descend into myself and try and have silent prayer, my mind goes off in a thousand different directions. I, I need to speak out my prayers, for instance. My quiet times aren't quiet. Um, I'm, I'd much rather, um, Andrew Wilson, who's, who also lives in, in uh, Eastbourne, says that uh, um, he's, he found a transformation when he started to think of them as happy times or joyful times rather than quiet times. Um, here is a time when you get to enjoy a special time with Jesus and hear from him through his word and, and speak back to him in prayer. So I, I think you've got to, you've got to find what works for you in terms of spending time with Jesus. Um, yeah. You know, to be honest, certainly silent prayer doesn't work for me. It's all spoken out. Prayer works much better. Written down prayer works best of all, actually. And what works for me, and, and that, that probably wouldn't work for anyone else, like probably, probably other people, if I told them to get out your laptop so that you can pray, most people would think that's, that's bananas. It's what works for me. <laughs> um, yeah. um, because I need to order my thoughts and otherwise I've got monkey mind and it just goes everywhere. But I just noticed the difference. I noticed the difference between unburdening myself on Jesus and the, and the other thing that really makes a difference in, in, in prayer time is Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. Um, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom. I always come to prayer time like I'm a, a, a busy worker or a world-weary sol soldier, right, coming to my sergeant major. And Jesus says, no, 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 change, change your mind, repent. Come as a little child before your father. Spend some time as a little child before your father. That will replenish you. That will restore you. That will give you the peace for the day. Yeah. What is it that motivates you and keeps you going after having a bad day, Glenn? I don't know. I, um, I've always got lots of things on the go. <laughs> um, so this is the monkey mind thing going. Uh, so <laughs> 
in in some ways, you know, if one thing doesn't, if one thing fails, then you know, I've got other things on the go. Which interestingly, um, I preached two weeks ago on Matthew thirteen, and uh, that does seem to be like the evangelist's mo is that you you sow the seed on different soils, and you'll come across a lot of different uh, reactions, and most of them in the end are not successful. There's only one good soil type that produces a crop 30, 60, 100 fold. You know, the other three soil types will break your heart at times. Um, yeah. And so what, what, what does Jesus kind of say? Well, keep sowing. You know, you have good seed. There is good soil. Keep sowing. And if that hasn't worked, that's OK. You can circle. You can circle back to that person if they've rejected you now. OK, that's all right. You can circle back. Move on to the next one. Move on to the next one. At some point. There is the soil type that gives you 30, 60, 100 times what is sown. And that, that gives you the, the spiritual encouragement to keep going with all the other sowing that's yes. going on. So, you know, my neighbor at the moment is like, woohoo, you know, you ask me about evangelism. I can't help but tell you about it. Oh, let me tell you about my neighbor. There's lots of other failure <laughs> that sort of happens. But you need to take your encouragements where you, where you can. And that gives you the, the inspiration to keep going. Yeah, really helpful. What resources or people have been most helpful to you as you've grown in your faith of, over the years, Glenn? I mean, like theological resources have really helped me. Um, so just just really um, understanding and appreciating and enjoying the Trinity, um, Father, Son and Spirit, that's just been massive. And so like Mike Reeves has written some, some amazing books like The Good God or Christ Our Life. That's been... Um, really good union with Christ has been another um, kind of doctrine that's just un unlocked so much of the Christian life and so much of evangelism as well so one forever is a short treatment of it by Rory Shiner or the whole Christ by Sinclair Ferguson's more theological meaty work but so like theology has really really helped but I, I, I love reading about practitioners as well um, so um, out of the salt shaker by Becky Manley Pippet. I, I love that book and and I love the way it begins with just an appreciation for Jesus and she just sort of retells the Jesus story in a in a, in a really um, fresh way that sort of evangelizes my heart and helps me to evangelize others. So yeah, lots of lots of resources kind of help and you know prayer mate app really helps with the prayer times. Um, daily prayer is um, a kind of a, an app that I do. That, that gets me my, my Bible in each morning, and, and that that really hit, that really helps. But um, yeah, yeah, lots of lots of resources. Glenn, the, the last forty five minutes have absolutely flown by. And before we let you go, do you have any closing thoughts? I what are my closing thoughts? Yeah, I, I guess just circling back to that. Um, it's about enjoying Jesus, isn't it? It's it's really. Um, if your evangelism is not what you want it to be, which for me, it's not. Um, if the mouth is not overflowing with words about Jesus, um, the, good, the good thing is we've got the solution. The solution is Jesus himself, you know. And I was, um, I was just reading this morning, Colossians chapter 2. Um, In Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And then verse 10 says, Colossians 2, verse 10, um, and you have been given fullness, which is just extraordinary. Like, like he just says, Colossians 2, verse 9, the fullness of deity dwells in Christ. And then the, the very next sentence is, and you have been given that fullness. What? It's like, we, we miss out on so much when we do not pursue Jesus, when we do not just put aside the deadly doing and take Jesus seriously when he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But in, in Christ, my goodness, the fullness, the fullness of God, which is in Christ by the spirit, is now by the spirit living in me. Enjoy that. Allow him to fill you so that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. Brilliant. What a way to finish. Glenn, how can people follow you on social media? Uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, I'm at Glenn Scrivener. Um, Facebook, Facebook kicked me off because basically somebody hacked my account and I still don't know what they posted, but whatever they posted was too spicy for Facebook. So they've canceled me. So I'm, 
Um, so I'm not on Facebook anymore, but um, on YouTube, be great uh, to, to have you subscribing to us. We are Speak Life UK. Oh, no, we're Speak Life Media. Speak Life Media um, on, on YouTube. We'd love to have you follow us and you can find all those links at speaklife.org.uk. Excellent. Well, we're going to gather up all of those links, Twitter um, and your YouTube channel, Glenn. We'll make sure that they're in the uh, show notes in the description below. Thanks again for your time. Really enjoyed it, Glenn. Pleasure. Thanks, David.